for 8th, 9th, and 10th grade parents, it seems like there was a bit of confusion as to the Connect Ed Messages audience, target audience, and um, so I do apologize for that. Uh, we'll make sure that doesn't happen again. It's never happened in my nine years, but first for everything. Um, thank you for, very much for coming out on a cold Monday. I know it's probably you know, not as appealing as your bed and Netflix, so thank you for being with us. I really appreciate it. So today we're going to be going over some of the basics and the core kind of tenets of the college application process, what your child can start doing now, 8th, 9th, and 10th grade to kind of prepare for that next step and make sure that they have as many opportunities and options as possible. Now, I sometimes get a little nervous when I give this presentation because I don't want kids getting anxious and kids feeling like they need to plan their entire futures when they're 13. That is not appropriate or responsible of us you know, to ask them to do. However, there are some things that they should just be aware of and that you as parents and guardians should be aware of so that you can really help them, as I said before, to have as many options as possible. You don't want to have any doors closed to them because they didn't take a certain test or they didn't, you know, participate in extracurriculars as we would have liked them to do. So that's really the purpose of today's presentation is to just really go over the, the core tenets of the application process and open doors for your child. Do I need the mic or can you all hear me without the mic? Am I good in the back or should I? Okay, so we'll put this back. Thank you. So in early June of 2020, 2021 or 2022, wow, that's a mouthful, your child will be graduating. It's very exciting. It's coming sooner than you may imagine. And all of our students have a lot of postgraduate options available to them. They could certainly stay home with all of you, right? And live in your basements and play video games, rent free, right? Is that everyone's hope and dream? They could work. There's a lot of our students who go off into the workforce. The military also. Uh, students are joining all different branches. They're also participating in ROTC in colleges to um, eventually go into the military. Technical schools, we have a phenomenal tech division here at the high school. We have a lot of students who are coming out with you know, professional certifications as they leave with their diploma so they can jump right into uh, the, the workforce and really make good money and then do very well. And then two or four year colleges. Of course, we have a wonderful array of colleges right here in the local area. We're very, very blessed in Massachusetts to have such a phenomenal education system. And the, not only at the community college level, but at the four-year level. And so historically here at Tantasco, about eight out of 10 seniors are attending a two or four-year university. And then the other two are usually going off to the workforce. Um, we have about 4% going off to the military every year. So you're here because you understand that college is valuable and college is important. Education beyond high school is important. Gone are the days where a student could graduate from high school and have you know, a job that they kept for 40 years, make a good living, raise a family. That is not the case anymore, unfortunately. Your child is going to quickly understand that getting a bachelor's degree, master's degree, doctoral degree, whatever it may be, really does provide them with a lot more opportunity and a lot more financial security and stability. And the quality of the high school preparation is going to determine the quality of the post-secondary plans that your child can access. And so there really is, and I, I really try to stress this to our students, there's a college for every student. There really and truly is. From our phenomenal two-year system to wonderful private schools that have you know, limited um, selection criteria to our most competitive schools like MIT or Harvard. There's a school out there for every kid with every passion, every strength, every talent. And we just want to make sure your students know that college is on the table for them. Even if they're not a stellar student or star athlete, they can go off to college. So let's first talk about what do colleges look for. What are the pieces of the puzzle that a college admission representative is going to be looking at when they evaluate your child and determine if your child gets into that college or not in you know, four, five, or six years? So this is kind of the overall piece of the puzzle. We have rigor of high school transcript, and I'm going to go through all of these more in detail. Grade point average, GPA, and rank. College entrance testing score.
scores, so SATs or ACTs, activities, interests, accomplishments, letters of recommendation, and the all stressful essay. So the more selective the college, the more important this criteria becomes. Um, some colleges, as I said, accept every single student who applies. Some are accepting 4%. So it really does depend on the tier of school your child is looking at, and they're going to weight these things differently or more importantly based on that school. So let's start with the transcript. This is really the key to everything. It's the most important part of a student's college application. We want your child to earn good grades. Now when I say good grades, I don't mean straight A's. You don't have to get straight A's, certainly. But we want them to put their best effort in the most challenging courses available to them. For some students, that's AP, Advanced Placement Classes. We have a huge array of advanced placement courses here. We have almost about 20 AP classes. And we have about, let's see, about 450 kids participating in AP classes in any given year. So we really have a huge, strong, robust AP program. Some students, that's exactly where they should be. It's taking college coursework in high school. If your student were to take the AP exam in May and get a three or four or five on it, they can earn college credit for that AP course, depending on the school, of course. Every school kind of handles it a little bit differently. But I just had a senior come back and tell me that because of the four AP classes he took and the fact that he got a three or four or five on all four of those, he can graduate UMass Amherst a semester early. So that's going to save him $25,000, which is kind of nice, right? So we just want to make sure that your child, again, is understanding these opportunities and understanding how we can set them up for some financial kind of security and success later on. So again, AP classes, it's college coursework in high school. We have AP classes in every discipline. And if that's the most appropriate level for your child, we want them to take those classes. For some students, honors is where they need to be. That's the challenge. They're going to you know, be challenged but do well. Then we also have below that college preparatory Who you are as a, as a person. 
you know, what have you been involved in, what are your passions, what do you like to do, who are you going to be on that college campus. But for a lot of schools still, GPA is, a, is an easy way to leave the chaff out, if you can see where I'm, where I'm going. So especially for the state universities and the public universities, um, they're really looking at grade point average to weed out students that they don't feel are going to be a good fit. So GPA is important and it will matter. So if you don't kind of know how GPA works, final grades in the academic subjects only are calculated and turned into point values. So an A, for example, in a CPA class is four points, 4.0. Um, in an honors class, it's A is 4.5. In an AP class, it's five. We give additional weight for honors and AP classes to make your child, you know, get some benefit out of challenging themselves with a more rigorous curriculum. So in math, English, science, history, foreign language, and the technical division core courses, so the tech courses do count for our technical division students, all of these final grades are converted into points and average, and that becomes your child's grade point average. Now they're recalculated at the end of each semester, except for freshman year. We don't give freshmen their GPAs after one semester. Just doesn't seem like a very responsible thing for us to do. They've only been in school for a few months. We wait until the end of ninth grade to give them their GPAs. And then after that, it's every semester we're recalculating that. Now the rank is based on GPA. So this year, for example, we have um, well, actually last year, let's use last year as an example, our valedictorian of our class had a 4.75. So as you can tell by that seeing that GPA, they had took, taken AP courses, taken honors classes, and gotten A's and A pluses in those, which is why they almost approached a five for their GPA. And because their GPA was the highest out of all the 300 students, they became number one in the class. So that was how the ranking was talking. Now GPA and rank is cumulative over the high school career. So ninth grade kind of starts every year, just kind of keeps adding and adding and recalculating, but it is cumulative. It's not that we're looking at one year in a vacuum. And freshman year, along those lines then, counts just as much as all the other years. So it is important for your child to be thinking about how they're doing academically in ninth grade because we don't want them to start at a deficit or be in a hole that they have to then dig their way out of over the course of a few years. And again, GPA being cumulative, we will send a six semester GPA to colleges. So that's ninth grade, 10th grade, and 11th grade. And at the end of 11th grade, whatever their GPA is, that's the GPA we send out to colleges in the fall of senior year. So that's why you'll hear a lot of talk about junior year being kind of a critical and important year. And that's because that's the end of it. We're sending out those transcripts and we're sending out those GPAs to colleges in the fall and that's the number they're gonna have is at the end of junior year. And again, so our GPA system is matched to the GPA weighting system of public, public universities in our state. So it's the same standard that UMass Amherst, Boston, Lowell, Dartmouth, Westfield State, Worcester State. It's the same GPA scale because we want our students to look at their GPA and know how the college is going to kind of tier them compared to everybody else. Okay? So it's the same GPA scale. You will see sometimes that some schools are taking a student's transcript, breaking it apart, and recalculating their GPA completely. Let's say it's a nursing program. They might only weight the science and math courses. They might not really be looking at the English courses and not factoring those into the GPA. So again, colleges are gonna do what they will with the GPA, but some colleges are gonna take it right at face value like our state system. So along with transcript strength, along with GPA and rank, the next piece of the puzzle is the dreaded standardized testing. How many of you have you know, flashbacks from that Saturday in, in high school taking the SATs, right? It was a little daunting, a little stressful, can be a little overwhelming. There's good news and bad news on standardized testing. So 
it is required by most colleges right now to uh, kind of look at students on a national barometer. That's really what the PSCTs, the SCTs, the ACTs are doing. They're trying to compare your child with another child in Idaho. Okay? They're trying to see what do they know, how is our curriculum preparing them. And this really is the only way for them to do that. The essay is not a national you know, barometer. The transcript is not exactly a national barometer because every school offers different things. But the SAT is an ACT or a good way to kind of see how your child stacks up against everyone else in the country who's taken that same test on that same day and, and how do they fare compared to that child in your child. So let's talk about testing. So the first test that your child's going to encounter is the PSATs. Now the PSAT stands for the Preliminary Scholastic Aptitude. This is an entirely optional test, and it's taken in the fall of sophomore and or junior year. We're recommending that students take it both, sophomore and junior year. We find that sophomores, it's a little nerve-wracking. They're getting into the rhythm of it. They take it during the school day, kind of get used to the questions. They get used to the formatting. They get used to the types of question and the content. So it's offered every October here at Tantasco and your child signs up in the guidance office. Then when they go to take the test in junior year, they're just a little bit better equipped uh, when they're taking the PSATs. And at that point, there's something called the National Merit Scholarship um, Qualifying Test. And so if your junior does really well on the PSATs, there could be scholarship money that comes to them. Um, so that's another reason why it's good to take it in sophomore year and junior year. The sophomore year gives you that prep to prepare for the scholarship portion in junior year. So again, it's a practice test. It prepares them for the SAT. It's the same format, same type of questions, same timing a little bit. And the scores are not reported to the college. So it really is just a no pressure way to get familiar with the material and familiar with the test. And as I said, the junior scores may qualify your child for a national scholarship. So again, taking in sophomore year is a really good benefit. So we give college entrance testing and PSATs every October to PSAT. And there's also a phenomenal connection between College Board, which is the owner of the PSAT, and Khan Academy. Has anybody heard of Khan Academy before? So Khan Academy partnered with the College Board, and they came up with a wonderful, free, personalized SAT prep program for your child based on their PSATs. This is another great reason to take the PSAT. So let's say your child takes the PSAT, struggles on word knowledge in the critical reading portion. What that's going to do is the PSAT is gonna, results are going to be fed into Khan Academy. They're going to be linked to those two accounts. And your child is then going to get PSAT and SAT prep focused on word knowledge. And that's going to help prepare them to do better on the PSAT the next time and the SAT eventually when they go to take that test. You don't need to go to Walmart and buy the giant books anymore. It's all online. It's all free. And Khan Academy is great because it's personalized. Every kid's um, program is totally different from the next students, which is a great resource. Quick question. Yes. With your experience, do you see correlation with PSAT and SAT? In terms of like scores going up? Yeah. Yeah, there, there's actually a lot of data on that. I would say that the SAT was kind of reconfigured a few years ago, so we're kind of starting a little bit from scratch in terms of trends and data. But we can absolutely point to what I saw. Is they said if you do six hours on Khan Academy, they were seeing about 120 point raise um, on the next time they took the test, the SAT or SAT. So there is value to it. There's actual point value. That's a great question. So the PSAT is obviously that preliminary one, and now we're moving into the SAT, which is when things get you know, a little bit more serious. There's subtext, reading, writing, and then math. And the score ranges are back to 200 to 800. It used to be three sections. They condensed it two years ago back to the possible high score of 1,600, which is what we're all used to. Now, the essay is optional. But 
and it will not be factored into the overall score, but we say you really should be taking the essay. Here's why. So there are a lot of schools out there that require the essay. And if your child doesn't take the essay portion and they want to apply to a college, and the college says, hey, you didn't take the essay, not, they can't just walk in and take the essay portion on Saturday. They have to go through the entire SAT again, take the entire test plus the essay so that they can then apply to that college. So again, we don't want your child to be boxed out and not have options and opportunities. And so that's why we really do encourage them to take the essay at least once. Maybe it's with you know the two or three times they take the test, but absolutely at least once so they have that opportunity to send them to school. Now again, as I just said, we recommend that you, the child take the, the SAT multiple times, two or three. Beyond three is madness, and you're not going to see a, a real negligible change in score. So it just doesn't really make a great deal of sense. But two or three times, again, it allows them to get the feeling for the format, the content, the curriculum, the music. Colleges are great in the sense that they're gonna cherry pick your score. So let's say your child takes the test in May and then takes it again in June. Maybe May they had a really high math score, June they had a high critical reading and writing score. The college is gonna, if you send both scores, they're gonna take the high scores from both of those two different administrations and put them together, and that's gonna be your child's super score, as they like to call it, okay? Now the SAT is administered here five times a year, October, November, December, for our fall seniors who are looking to get prepped and kind of give one last shot. And then it's also offered in May and June. That's really for the junior class. We want them to take the SAT for the first time in May or June of junior year to prepare for senior year. Any questions on any of this? When did you say it's given? So it's given every year, October, November, December. That's really the senior targeted audience. And then May and June is for the juniors. Now the subject tests are a little bit different. The subject tests are also by the college board and they are one hour tests in one content area. So it could be math level one, math level two, chemistry, biology, history. Really, these are required by some colleges but not every college. Really, it's usually the most selective of schools or the most selective of programs, like you know some kind of engineering programs. Again, they're testing specific subjects, and they're best taken near the conclusion of an advanced course. So I was in an AP US History classroom today talking to them about the subject test and telling them, hey, you're in AP US History, you're gonna take the AP test in May, why not also take the, the subject test in history and have that in your back pocket? It doesn't hurt, right? It's one hour, and they can take up to three subject tests on this, at the same amount of time that they would take the regular SAT. So a student really could sit and take, you know, chem, history, and math level one on one day, and hopefully that all goes well. The other reason that I talk to students about subject tests is there's two tuition waivers out in the world for our students in Massachusetts. One is called the Stanley Z. Coplet Certificate of Mastery with Distinction. It's a long name, but it does give your child free tuition for four years at a public university if they qualify. Now, the way you initially qualify for this tuition waiver is to score well on your MCAS exams. So if they got proficient and advanced in science, math, and English, they would initially qualify for this waiver. The second part, to fully qualify, the students need to get certain scores on AP exams or SAT subject tests. So, if your student did very well in MCAS and initially qualified for standards and conflict, and they've already had taken two of these and met the minimum scores, hey, they just got free tuition for four years. That can amount to around $7,000 at UMass Amherst, for example, which is our most expensive public school. So the subject test, again, you may not need them for college per se, but you absolutely could be using them for a free tuition waiver for school. The ACTs is another type of college entrance testing. It's different in format from the SAT, and it's the American College Test. And I have not heard of a college.
college that will only accept the SAT and not the ACT, or only accept the ACT and not SAT. They're pretty much interchangeable at this point in time. This whole range is completely different, 1 to 36. And they have different subtests, English, math, reading, science, and writing. The ACT is a nice fit for some kids who have that strong scientific and, scientific and technical background, and also it um, can substitute for the SAT and subject tests in some cases as well. So instead of taking an SAT subject test for a college, the ACT might count for that. It's, again, it's a little bit more of a test of memory. Uh, it's how much did you kind of gather from your curriculum and your classes, how much did you soak up and retain. Um, some kids do a little bit better on you know, SAT or, or ACT, it just kind of depends on your child. I wouldn't say the scores are like this, you know, one kid's getting 1600s on SATs and bombing the ACTs. The, the scores are pretty much comparable, but sometimes you might find that one test is just a little bit better fit for your child. We don't offer the ACT here. Um, we used to, but we had like 10 testers. So we just kind of said it wasn't really worth it financially for us anymore to, to do it. But it is offered in Munson and Worcester pretty frequently. So your child absolutely can go and take the ACT somewhere, just not here at Tantasa. So I did, yes, ma'am? If students were to think that how would they enroll in So So just like the SATs, all the registration is done online. So ACT.org and then collegeboard.org is for the SAT and the AP exam. Now, I did see that there was good news with testing. There is a trend now where a lot of colleges are foregoing standardized testing completely. They're really not looking at those scores and they're becoming test optional schools. Now, this can be a little deceiving sometimes uh, because sometimes these colleges will say, you don't have to provide us with your testing scores to apply and be accepted, but for scholarships, we do want the, the SATs or the ACTs. So again, you just want to make sure you're doing your research. It doesn't hurt to have the test done and in the bag and then you know, have the opportunity to apply for scholarships or to any college they're really interested in. But if you're interested in looking at a list of schools that does not require testing, it's fairtest.org, F-A-I-R-T-E-S-T.org, that has a nice listing of all the schools that are now test optional. So if your child is not a super great tester, that's a good place to start in terms of your college searching. So a lot of kids and parents are wondering, like, how do I prepare for the test? How do I make sure my scores are the highest they can possibly be? Really what we tell them is doing good work in the most challenging classes possible. That's what's really going to get your child to be doing the best that they can on the test. Taking those upper level English classes is going to give them that word knowledge, that content analysis, the literary analysis skills, you know, going as far as they can in math, algebra 2, geometry, algebra 3. That really is the best way to prepare for the SATs and the ACTs. Again, taking the PSATs at least once, hopefully twice, sophomore and junior year. It's a good time to take those tests and really get familiar with them, take some of the anxiety out of them. And then again, there's a lot of test prep resources. Every child has a smartphone. Um, let's use them for good rather than evil. They can do SAT question of the day and the ACT question of the day. It's an app you download. It'll send them a little question from an old SAT exam. They pick an answer. It tells them why they're right and why they're wrong. It takes a minute. And it's a nice way, 365 days a year, to kind of stay fresh and stay up to date on some of that SAT prep. On the College Board and ACT websites, of course, there's free full-length practice tests, as we talked about in the academy. And then, of course, there's private test companies. They're a lot of money for thousands and thousands of dollars. I, for my money, I would do Khan Academy first. I would see how that got you, because I think the fact that it's personalized makes it very, very but again, there's a lot of test prep out there. And every March, Mr. Willis <coughs> offers out um, an SAT prep course for a few weeks. It's free. You just have to buy the test booklet, which is $20 or so. And students come every Saturday morning and they do some SAT prep with, with two of our teachers. So that's a nice opportunity as well for your child. So the next piece of the puzzle, in addition to transfer strength, GP 
GPA, ranked standardized testing, is getting involved. So extracurriculars and activities. Remember, colleges are residential communities. They're not just places where kids go to class and then leave. So they're trying to build community. They're trying to figure out, is your child going to be a good fit for our, our community passion, our community mission, our purpose, you know, the type of student that gravitates towards us. And so they want to see students that are going to be involved. They don't want kids coming to their campuses that are just going to be in their rooms all day. That's not, you know, who they're looking for. So again, we want colleges, or the colleges want students that are well-rounded. And we really say that every kid can be involved in something. They don't have to be a star athlete. They don't have to be the star of the play. They can just be involved, committed, involved kids. That is phenomenal. We have over 70 clubs and activities for kids here at Tantasqua. I feel like there's not any kid that I can point to that couldn't find something here that they gravitate towards, whether it's anime club, Model UN, uh, sports, we have you know the newspaper, we have Amnesty International, we have everything you can kind of think of. Yoga. So again, just you, your child has to get committed, has to get involved starting in ninth grade. You don't want them to show up all of a sudden in senior year and say, I didn't do anything. That doesn't look good on a college application. We say depth is better than width meaning your child finding two or three activities that they're committed and involved in for four years, that's kind of the best case scenario. We want them to be committed to these organizations. With is better than nothing. So if your child dabbled in one club and then changed their mind and went to the next club, at least it's something. Um, I had a student a few years ago, he was a 4.2 GPA, applying to some really great schools. When it came time to put his activity resume together, we had nothing to put on it, not one thing. He was scrambling, we were trying to find some things he could join senior year. It was too late, he got denied from all the colleges that he was really passionate about. And had to, you know, maybe settle for something that wasn't his first choice. Because again, he didn't get himself out there and involve himself. So again, we want your child to be involved. High school, Involvement, there's clubs, publications, sports, student government, drama, music. They could also just do things in the community, Boy Scouts, Girl Scouts, church, um, dance, anything. It doesn't matter, volunteering. But we never want them to wait until sophomore, junior, senior year to become involved. So in addition to the activities the letters of recommendation are the other place where your child is really going to come alive on the page and be more than their transcript, be more than their GPA. Because I can bet you that there's going to be a kid somewhere in the country applying to that same school your child is with the same rank and the same transcript similar and the same GPA. This is where they start to become unique and different and it's all about making connections with teachers who can write nice things about your child and honest things and valuable things. So typically each student has two teachers and their guidance counselor write a letter of recommendation. So the teachers are typically writing more about their academic performance, how they tackle challenges in the classroom, some of their strengths in terms of projects or maybe they're super into discussions or, you know, they're going to touch on a lot of different things that they see in the classroom. The guidance counselor letter is much more holistic. We're talking about who they are as a person. We're talking about a kind of a broad overview of them. We're also talking about perhaps some special circumstances that have impacted your child or impacted their academic performance. And mission recs look to our letter to explain maybe discrepancies in a transcript or you know why is the student getting 1,500 on the SATs but they're getting C's in their classes? You know what's the disconnect? Our letter really does work to provide a lot of good context for how your child is done uh, in their classes. So a good strategy is to have students ask teachers who they've had a class with, preferably in junior year. Um, that's the year, you know, right before the letters are starting to be written. Teachers have them fresh in their minds. There's a lot of material to write about. 
we don't want them to go back to freshman year teachers or sophomore year teachers. You know, three years later, that teacher may not really have a good sense of who your child is today. And it may not be the most useful and beneficial level for your child. The other strategy is to pick a teacher they've had more than once. So sometimes you'll have an English teacher for Lit and Comp 1, for example, and then you'll have them again for American Literature. So that's a teacher they're seeing in junior year, but it's a teacher they're seeing twice. So that teacher can see their growth, can see how they matured, what they're really strong in. So it's all about those relationships. Again, I had another really strong kid who's about a 4.1. I said, who do you want to write your letters of recommendation? Who have you really made some good connections with? He didn't have any. He had just stuck to himself, didn't really go out of his way to make connections with those teachers. And they, it was really hard to find people to write anything valuable for him, for his letters of recommendation. So it's about, again, putting your child putting themselves out there, staying after for help sessions, engaging themselves in the classroom, materials and discussions, and really connecting because then your teachers are going to be thrilled to write a letter and they're going to be able to say a lot of really great things about your child. Additional letters sometimes can be written by coaches, pastors, internship supervisors. So for example, I have a student who's going off to be an elementary educator and she's been in a first grade classroom all year working. That letter makes sense because she's going into elementary ed. We want to hear what the teacher has to say about her strengths, her talents in that specific area. But remember, some of these colleges are reading hundreds, you know, hundreds, thousands of letters, and they're not going to have time to read every, you know, thing that everybody has to say if it's not entirely relevant. So usually it's two teachers and a counselor. Again, sometimes there's these outside people who it does make sense for them to hear from. Any questions on letters of recommendation? The last piece of the puzzle, in addition to the letter of recommendation, is the common essay. This is, again, where your child is going to come off the page. It's going to be a voice now. It's not just numbers. It's not just a transcript. It's not just a CPA. The essay is, in my mind, one of the most important parts of the college application because it's letting your child speak from their voice, from their perspective, and that college admission rep is really able to figure out, is this person a good fit for our college community? The essay's gonna bring that student to life and again, separate them from other people with similar test scores, similar GPA, similar transcript. It's that holistic approach to the application. In my experience, sometimes the most ordinary topics have become the most extraordinary and the most impactful when they're written about love. We have every year um, four college representatives come and they talk to us. One of them was from BC. She's phenomenal. She tells every year she tells me this, tells the same story to the crowd. I ask them, what's the most impactful letter you've ever had? She said that the best letter she ever read was about a girl's dresser in her bed. And it was about how the dresser had been covered with stickers, you know, My Little Pony, and all these things about her childhood. Then the girl became very self-conscious about the dresser because it represented her past. It represented who she was, you know, many years ago. She wanted to rip all the stickers off and refinish it and make it glam and, you know, perfect. And then kind of decided, like, no, this is me. This is my story. This is who I am. This is how I got here. And that letter has has literally stuck with this BC rep for about seven years now. Every year I ask her, every year she tells me it's that essay still. So again, it's, who would think that an essay about a dresser would be really anything? But for her, it made all the difference in the world, and that was why that student got into BC, is because of that, that essay. Um, some other great essays I've read recently, there was a girl who compared her ADHD to losing a green sock in her room. She did a great job kind of showing what it's like to struggle with ADHD every day and how it's tough to organize your mind. It was wonderfully written. Um, I had a student this year write about um, her little sister and how she just adores her little sister. And again, it seems kind of ordinary, but again, the way she wrote it was very, very powerful and very impactful. 
And I love working with students on their essays. I'm a former English teacher, so whenever they come in, I always want to always want to read with them and, and work it out with them. So the Common App, you don't have to know too much about it right now, but basically it's about 500 schools that all use the same application. Um, so it's nice because if your child is applying to like eight schools and they're all Common App schools, they fill out one application and send it to eight schools. It's like eight separate applications, so it really can be a nice time saver. Every year they release the essay prompts for the next year, and I just wanted to put them out to you so that you can start to just get a sense of what some of the essays you know, your child might be asked to write about in a few years. So the first one is select a background identity, identity interest, or talent that's so meaningful your application would be incomplete without it. The next one is lessons we take from obstacles, how did you overcome a challenge or a failure or a setback. The third one is reflect on a time when you questioned or challenged a belief or an idea. Number four is what's a problem you'd like to solve? How would you solve it? Describe an accomplishment that sparked a period of personal growth. Describe something that's so engaging that you lose all track of time when you work on it. And then the last one is an essay topic of your choice. So kids can really write about pretty much anything. There's not a lot of parameters in place for the essay. Um, but, you know, you should start thinking about how to separate themselves now. If something really powerful happened to them in ninth or 10th or 11th grade or 8th grade, you know, they can use that as, as material to report their, for their essay. So now that we've talked about what the college application basically consists of, I wanted to talk a little bit about the differences between public and private colleges. So, we have a lot of great public schools, UMass. We have the UConn Huskies, and then we have our private schools like Harvard and Boston College. The public means they're state tax supported, um, which often means they're less costly for us as Massachusetts residents. So that would be all of the UMasses, the state universities, and our community colleges. Private schools are tuition funded, typically a bit more costly. Again, this doesn't really take into consideration packages that kids get for merit or for financial need. But Harvard, Tufts, Assumption, Nichols, AIC, etc. Then we have something kind of that's middle ground, which is out of state public. So they think about you know, the University of Connecticut, University of Rhode Island, UNH, Maine. These are all state universities, but they're out of state. So they're a little bit more costly than an in state public school but sometimes less costly than a private school like Harvard or, or Clark. And there's also a really great relationship called tuition rate, which is if I was interested in some very niche major here and it was only offered at you know an out-of-state school like URI and it wasn't offered in any of my in-state public schools, you can get Massachusetts rates at that out-of-district, out-of-state school if they don't offer it in-state for you in terms of the major. So that is nice to know too. Now, we talk about the public schools being less costly, but because they're tax-supported, they can put parameters in place as who they're going to accept and who they're going to allow to apply. And so all of the minimum standards to be admitted to all the UMass and state universities is up here. So you have to get a 3.0 or better now. That's a B average. So if you want to apply to any of the masses or any of the state universities, you need a 3.0 GPA. I think sometimes students are unaware of that. We tell them every year, but it's easy to forget. There is something called the sliding scale, thankfully. If you have between a 2.0 and a 2.99 GPA, you can still apply as long as you have high enough SAT and ACT scores. So again, this is another reason to take the SATs, take the ACTs, do some of that test prep. You don't want to be boxed out of applying to UMass, you know, Lowell, for example, because you didn't have a 3.0, or you didn't have the SAT scores to apply on that sliding scale. If you have below a C average, a 1.99 or below, you cannot apply. So at that point, you're looking at either community colleges or you're looking at some of the private universities that don't have these very strict parameters in place. In addition to the GPA, 
there are course requirements that every state university has to um, abide by. For all the students who want to apply have to abide by. So not only do our students have to complete our graduation requirements, they also need to take Algebra 1, Geometry, Algebra 2, and a math course senior year beyond Algebra 2. If they don't have a math in their senior year schedule, they cannot apply. So that's, again, why we're very strategic counselors when we're putting the schedules together to make sure that kids are going to be able to meet that requirement. The other piece of the puzzle is foreign language. We don't require foreign language to graduate from Tantasqua, but all of the uh, state universities require at least two years of foreign language in the same language. So that's either Spanish 1 and 2, French 3 and 4, those are the two we offer. So something along those lines in those two, two languages. Any questions on these standards? Private schools, as we talked about, have a much wider range of, of admission criteria. They can set their own standards. Some schools are selecting you know, less than 10% of applicants, and on the other end, some colleges are accepting everybody who applies, just depending on the college, the private college that you're looking at. You know, sometimes you're paying a little bit more, but you don't have to have this, this criteria with 3.0, SAT scores, foreign language, et cetera. We're also very lucky here, as I said, to have phenomenal community colleges. Quinn Sig was at one point the fastest growing community college in the country. And they're doing some really amazing things and have created great relationships with our local four-year universities as well. And so I wanted to highlight something called the Mass Transfer Program. So Mass Transfer is when a student goes to Quinn Sig for two years and then transfers to a four-year university for the junior and senior year. So they're getting their bachelor's degree in the same amount of time as they would um, if they started at the four-year institution, but there's a lot of financial savings <laughs> that come along with starting at the community college for two years. So as a part of mass transfer, there's certain bonuses that you get if your GPA is solid enough in, at, in the associate degree program. So if you have a 2.0 final GPA and you have your associate's degree, you get a free application, full transfer of credits applied to your bachelor's degree, and you automatically have all of your gen eds satisfied at the receiving institution. If you have a 2.5 or higher, plus your associates, you get all of the above, plus guaranteed admission to any mass state for your university. That's pretty phenomenal. And last but not least, if you have a 3.0 at the community college and you get your associates degree, you get all of the above, including that guaranteed admission, and you also get a 33% tuition waiver or full tuition waiver at UMass Amherst or UMass School. So again, that's nice, nice financial uh, benefit. Now, how many of you remember the days where UMass Amherst was called ZooMass? Anybody remember those days, right? They are gone. <laughs> those days are gone. Now the average GPA for, uh, for UMass Amherst is a 3.76. So it's almost, a, it's an A minus, A average. Um, sometimes kids can't get off to UMass Amherst right away. They just don't have the GPA for it. So this is a nice way to kind of get there um, eventually and save a little bit of money along the way. In addition to the mass transfer, Quinn Sig and the other uh, community colleges in the state have something called articulation agreements. These are agreements of transfer between them and private schools in the local area. So as you can see here, there's over 65 articulation agreements with 25 institutions for very specific programs. What I really find phenomenal is, is the WPI path. Um, we have Worcester Polytechnic Institute is a phenomenal school. It's really hard to get into. Some students just can't get there right away from high school. Uh, two years ago, we had a girl. She's going off to Quincy. She's finishing up her second year. And then she's going to be transferring to WPI for their five-year program. So she's often not, you know, saving money, got into the school of her dreams, worked hard and got herself there. So there's a lot of really wonderful opportunities. Criminal justice at Anne Maria, Assumption, Westfield, dental hygiene, human services, nursing, um, business administration, a lot of different options for your child. So they could start at a community college and then transfer here after two years. 
And what I'd like to just remind everybody about again is either public or private, there is a college out there for every kid, and the options are going to depend on how well prepared they are in high school. And it's all about fit. We use that word probably too much with our students, but it's true. You want them to find a college that's the right fit academically, socially, personally, spiritually, and so on and so forth. So this is sad part of the presentation. We're talking about money. I feel like I should give cookies out or something at this point, or tissues. I don't really know. I think it's something good. So let's talk about how much it's all going to cost you. Sorry. Um, UMass Amherst. So I went on to the web and got all the, the cost uh, breakdowns. This year, uh, tuition and fees is $15,787. Room and board is $13,000 and change. It's about $28,926 total cost per year. Okay. That's really massive. If you can get it, it's really hard. This thing. <laughs> tuition is about this much. Fees are about this much. So when they say, you know, for Abigail Adams or Stanley Z. Coppock, the tuition is waived, kids get in their mind thousands of dollars. It's, it's just not. The fees are always going to be more than that tuition. It's, I, there's, it's so different. It's, it's like line items. There's like 30 line items of like, here's this fee, here's this fee, here's this fee. I just figured fees. So Holy Cross, a little different. $49,980 for tuition and fees, $13,000 for room board, about $64,000 per year. Again, we talk about that community college being a great option. It's not just for kids who can't get into these schools right away, and that's how they, I think, have been thought about in the past. Now it's coming down to financial necessity and financial, you know, kind of smarts. You know, I'm not maybe going to feel comfortable paying sixty-four thousand a year. Maybe I'm more comfortable paying six thousand a year, and then having my kid get the WPI degree after they get their associates. You know, so it, it does come down to those financial conversations with your child and your family. Um, and again, this does not include merit scholarships, financial aid, you know, work study. There's a lot of things that are going to bring down these costs. But again, it's if your child is a big fish in a small pond. If, they, if the college wants them, if the college finds them amazing and needed in that campus, they're going to want to get them in the door. They're going to give them money to entice them to sign on the dotted line and go there. So you know, these are just the flat costs. But there is, there's a ton of kids. One of my students came in today. She got $25,000 a year for four years at the School of her dream. She's thrilled. So now it's at the price of about a state university. She can afford it. Her family can afford it now. So that those stories happen all the time. But I just want to give you a kind of an overall sense of the difference between public and private. So to compare in-state and out-of-state kind of public, so we have UMass again, same cost, 28, 926 per year. Let's compare it to UNH. So about 30,000 for tuition fees, about 12 for room and board, 41 for the total cost per year for the out-of-state public. So Holy Cross was 63,000, this is 41, and the mass is about 30. So again, you can kind of see the, the difference between out-of-state public, in-state public, and private institutions. This is a little chart that I created a few years ago just to kind of look at how much you could save going to community college. So Quincy is 6,500 per year. That's everything. Uh, they don't have four-year tuition, four-year cost total, four-year savings, because it's only a two-year degree. But at Worcester State, you have about 9,500 for tuition and fees. Over four years, it'd be about 38,000. It costs you 32,000 to start at Quincy for two years, and that's a savings of about six grand. If you started at Quincy and then went off to UMass, you'd save about $18,000, almost $19,000. And if you started at Quincy and then went off to WPI, you would save $88,000 over four years. So again, it's just kind of thinking about, does this option make sense for my child from a financial standpoint? And I don't know what college is going to cost. I don't know. When this boy is born, I do not know what I will be paying. I'm a little terrified. You know, you guys will walk me off the ledge, right, in, in 18 years, and we'll, we'll get through it together. But it's, it can be daunting, and it can be overwhelming. 
But again, as we talked about, there's financial aid, there's merit-based, there's need-based. Um, the FAFSA is the best way to get that money. It's the free application for federal student aid, and it determines what your family can contribute based on a formula, and then your financial aid is based upon that EFC, the expected family contribution. Financial aid packages, as I said, grants, scholarships, work study, loans. There's need-based, there's merit-based. There's a lot of different ways that your child can get money to go to college. So you probably are not gonna be looking at 63 grand a year. But it, it is worth thinking about how much can you afford now? Because you don't want your child to get into the school of their dreams. You can't afford it. You have to have a very tough conversation. Those conversations are very ugly to have. So if you start now and kind of talk about, well, here's what we can afford as a family, and here's how much debt you really should be going into or not going into, those conversations can save a lot of party uh, later on down the line, once we're actually looking at schools. Again, with financial aid, just start saving as much as you can now. I know it's incredibly hard to do that in these times. Um, 403Ds are great. Anything you can do to help, um, applying for aid early. So if your child can apply early to the college and for financial aid, there's a bigger pool of money. When that pool of money runs out because your child missed the deadline or applied at the end of the deadline of the window, there's just not going to be as much available to them. So that's why it's important to really have everything organized and, and be on time with everything so that they can have access to that largest pool of money as possible. And then being wanted. If a college looks at a student is better, special, more talented, more aid could be given. Because again, they're trying to raise the, the stats of who's going off to their college. What is the average GPA of the kid going off to this school? If your student could help those numbers, or if your student is going to be that bassoonist in the band that they've been desperately needing, or if your student's going to be, you know, joining a, a major that's really, really small, like, you know, classics or Latin, that might be enough to kind of get them through the door. If they're just going to be a psych major, maybe it's not as appealing to that college, and maybe they might pass on them. But if they're applying to a very unique program or a small program, or they have that unique talent, that can really make all the difference. My husband was a bassoonist. That helped him. There's not a lot of them in the world, right? So that helped him get into school and it helped him get a fair amount of money when he went. So as I talked about before, there's also the tuition waivers that does bring down the cost of college. There's that Stanley Z. Copeland one and the John and Abigail Adams. They're based on MCAS scores. Um, Stanley Z. Copeland is only initially qualifying, then you have to fully qualify with AP or, AP or SAT subject tests scores. Abigail Adams is just based on MCAS scores. If you get certain scores and you're in the top 25% of the class, you're in. You're done. You don't have to do anything else and you get that free tuition. And this is what it kind of amounts to these days. So for four years, at UMass Amherst is about 6,300. Worcester State is about 4,000. Quinn State is about 1,500. So where can you get help? Here we are. So we have a lot of wonderful people here. Um, it's been a little bit of a crazy month. Our pipes exploded in guidance, and we had a flood, and we had all our pipes freeze. It was about 20 degrees, and we've been in kitchenettes and closets and three to a room. We just moved into trailers today, so we actually kind of have like space now. Um, but we're here. We're here and available to you anytime, all the time. Uh, you'll meet Mrs. Flanagan. She is the freshman counselor. She handles all of the ninth grade population. She's a wonderful resource to kind of calm your nerves about your child going off into high school. This can be a very overwhelming experience. We have our sophomore technical division counselor, Nancy Sawyer. And then we have our academic 10th through 12th division folks. Myself, I handle A through B. Mrs. Coonan, Ms. McDarman, Mr. Kingley's a lone male department. We're all available and it's all based on last name in tech division or academic. And then we have our technical 11th and 12th grade counselor, Mary Rose. So all of our information is on the website. You can call, you can email, you can schedule a meeting if you want to come in and talk. We're happy to walk you through any of this. And even if I'm not your child's counselor designee, I'm happy to talk to any parent anytime about anything. 
We have a lot of great resources on our guidance webpage, and then also on MEFA, MEFA.org, M-E-F-A, the Massachusetts Educational Financing Authority. They have some really great financial aid resources for you to start prepping and thinking about what you want to do to save for college. So there's a lot of future info sessions coming up. So tomorrow we have our school day for selection assembly for our current ninth grade class, our incoming 10th grade. So I'm going to be speaking to them about what they're going to be taking as sophomores and going to pick classes. We have a really nice system here. We meet with all the students at the assembly, and then we each have an individual meeting with every single student in the entire school to pick their classes individually with them. So we're walking your child through this process, and we're helping them figure out what's the best path for them. Thought 